This is Gary Swanson interviewing Harvey J. Freed, Harvey, who is chairman of the Historic Garment District Group here in Kansas City. He's also the president of the Freed Siegel Company. Harvey has an excellent understanding and background on the garment industry in Kansas City, as well as personal experience in the garment industry. Harvey, before we get started about your personal involvement in the uh, garment industry, uh, tell me about the history, to the best of your recollection and knowledge, of, of, up until the time that you and your family got into the industry in Kansas City. Right. Actually, there was uh, some textile, wholesale textile product distribution that took place here in the greater Kansas City area. It started way back in the late 19th century down in the West Bottoms, but because of constant flooding and problems like that, the companies decided to move up here and the first wholesale textile company moved up to the northeast corner of 8th and Broadway in 1898 and built a building there as presently the Folgers Coffee Building. Which is a block away from where we are in the historic. It's right across the street from Right across the street from where we are. From where we are now. And that was the first edifice that was built to house a wholesale textile distributing company. From that date until the beginning of First World War, 1914-1915, that area, all the rest of the major buildings that were built in the Garment District were built in that period of time. And they were built principally to house wholesale textile product distribution, dry goods, uh, work clothing, even school supplies, products like that. And so the, uh, there were distributors here, uh, wholesalers to the retail trade, from whom did they buy? Where were these products manufactured? Mostly all on the East Coast. Nothing was imported in those days. Everything was done on the East Coast. Uh, the reason Kansas City became such a big wholesale distribution outlet because of the rail system that originated out of Kansas City. So that our trade territory up to World War I was considered the largest trade territory for any city in the world, according to the National Historic Registry because we covered the entire western part of the United States. And that continued until World War I. After World War I, Kansas City changed a bit and some major mail order houses moved into the area. Sears Roebuck, Montgomery Ward, National Cloak and Suit, Bell Assess. These mail order houses moved into the Kansas City area to distribute from here. And they needed manufactured products. And their interest in having products manufactured gave rise to the... So the interest on the part of these major distributors, like Sears, Roebuck, etc., gave rise to manufactured goods? The manufacturing began, really started to take off then in the Kansas City area. And as the towns in the West started to develop their own wholesale distribution era, areas, the wholesale distribution from the Kansas City area began to diminish in importance and manufacturing began to increase in the 1920s. That trend continued uh, pretty much through the rest of the time that there was a viable garment district down here. Mm -hmm. In uh, uh, who are some of the uh, primary companies in the textile goods wholesaling business in Kansas City? Well, the ones that I'm familiar with that were during my period of time with the H.T. Point Extra Company and the Fitz Dry Goods Company, they were the major big wholesale distributors to retail stores throughout the, this part of the country. And, and they, the West. they had uh, uh, salesmen on the road? They had salesmen on the road, they had catalogs, they had buyers that would come in from time to time from all over the West. Hmm. So that was big, and then when the bigger, when the Sears Roebucks, the uh, Montgomery Ward's Bell SS came to town. They weren't manufactured goods, so ah, we've got manufacturing companies springing. Up. That's right. And that was in what the 20s? The, after World War One. After so World War. Starting in the 20s. Starting in the 20s, and continuing right up until World War Two. And, and when did you? When did your family get into the textile business? 
our family was at both ends of that business. We started the family business, the Freed Seagull Company, started in 1930 in the Coates House as a wholesale distributor of ladies' dresses and some coats. Now that was your father? My father started the business. And what was his name? His name was Joseph Freed. Started in 1930. 1930 in the 1930. Coates House. And, uh, his background was not in the garment business. He had never been involved in manufacturing. He was basically a, an accountant, financial guy who had moved here from New York. And so was he was he born in uh, this country? He was born in New York City. Right? And uh, your mother, what was her name? Her name was Rhea, R-E-A, Freed. And what's her maiden name? Her maiden name was Levine. And was she born in this country no, as well? No, she was not. She was born in, the, in Russia. And uh, they moved to Kansas City after my dad had been in an advertising business in New York that had not been successful. So a cousin of his suggested he come to Kansas City. They moved here in 1929 and opened the Freed Seagull Company in 1930. And the reason he came to Kansas City was he had a cousin here? Who suggested there was a good possibility to hmm. make a living here in the wholesale apparel business. Going back in your family, uh, where did your mama, Rhea, how old was she when she came over from Russia to uh, the United States? Uh, best we can be sure of, she was about three years old, three or four, perhaps. Okay, so she was living, raised in New York City. No, Stamford, Connecticut. Stamford, Connecticut, Connecticut, north of uh, the city. Right. And uh, then found and married your dad sometime. Uh, what year was that they were married? Do you remember? They were married in 1926. 1926? 26. 26. Uh -huh. And I came along in 27, mm -hmm. short, early 27, right? Mm -hmm. uh, prior to their coming to uh, Kansas City. Right, yes. So you were born in Stanford? Or? I was, no, I was born in New York City. New York right. City. Uh, before we go into your own uh, history a little farther in the business, how about, uh, do you have brothers and sisters? I have one sister. She was, she briefly worked in the business after college and then she left and moved to Chicago where she subsequently married, raised a family, and still lives in the Chicago area. Mm. So you're the remaining uh, remnant of the Freed family right. in uh, Kansas City. Correct. That's correct. Mm. So your daddy and mom came, and he, at the urging of a cousin, he says, I think Kansas City might be a good place. Right. Uh, did he have any knowledge of, uh, of the garment business, the textile business, when he came? None whatsoever. Uh, Siegel had been a boyhood friend of his, and they were in the advertising business together, so they decided to set up this wholesale outlet in Kansas City, and Siegel would remain in New York and be the resident buyer, and Dad would be in Kansas City running the operation here. And that's how it started, and that's how it continued. Uh, Siegel left the business in 1947, and uh, subsequently, though, in 1939, or prior to that time, in 1939, my dad started a coat manufacturing company called Styline Manufacturing Company, a maker of junior coats and suits. Uh, he was principally an investor, did the financial work there, and with partners with Siegel, who was still remain in New York, and a gentleman who was a designer and production man who knew, who knew something about garment manufacturing. Together they started the company in 1939. We, we continued in the coat manufacturing business until 1957. We closed it then. But Freed Seal Company continued. Now you went to you went to war and you, because of your age. You were at the tail end of World War II, but you went to war in uh, in World War II. Correct. And then when you came back, did you join your father's company? No, I came back. I finished college on the GI Bill and did a little graduate work. Then I came into the business in 1950. In 1950, and so uh, was uh, Freed Siegel at that time a distributor as well as Skyline uh, Manufacturing Styline, S T Y, Styline, 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 Styline. You know. Styline. Right. Okay. So were, was he still in both businesses at the time that you came and Correct. joined the business? And I, in fact, I went into the manufacturing business initially, not the wholesale business, because uh, everybody thought the big future was in manufacturing. There had been a, manufacturing during World War II had had some difficulty because it was hard to get raw material. 
price controls and things made things very difficult. So most of the factories here did some contract work for the government, manufacturing uniforms and things like that. But after the war, there was a big spurt in demand for soft goods because hard, hard line products, washing machines, dryers, cars, were hard to get because of the huge demand right after the war. So soft goods boomed for a while there, and uh, I went into that business at mm -hmm. that time. So was your, uh, was your dad in the uniform business or doing something to support the war effort during the time the war was on? Well, he, by something I mean, manufacturing uniforms or he did a bit of that, not very much. Uh, that's a long story. But Freed Seal Company continued to buy and distribute uh, dresses, sportswear, coats, things like that. Mm -hmm. But as Freed Seal Company had had to change its direction so many times after we closed the coat manufacturing business, we started to outsource manufacturing for lady sportswear, sweaters skirts, blouses, uh, that sort of product under other brand names, that our own brand names, and we distributed those through our own sales organization throughout the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when was that that you got out of the, you came back in what year and joined the joined manufacturing the side of the business? Actually, it was 1949. In 1949, and so tell me a little bit about the history of Style Line or allied companies during that the time from 49 till you got out out of the manufacturing business how big were you how many salesmen did you have did you have your own designers were you doing knockoffs uh how did that work both we had we had our own designers and of course we did knockoffs because we were in the moderate price range our customer wouldn't wear or didn't want to be in the vanguard of high fashion they would only accept the product after they were comfortable by seeing it accepted, generally speaking. So it was very common to get garments that had been good sellers from higher price lines, and our designers would copy them and modify them to be able to be manufactured mm -hmm. in our... For your clientele, which was how many uh, states did your uh, reps cover? Covered principally everything from the Alleghenies to the Rocky Mountains. And occasionally we'd have sales reps on the West Coast. That, but our, the strength of our distribution was the center part of the United States. Now, the, New York was the garment industry, and then it moves to Chicago, some of it. Then it moves to Kansas City, the manufacturing. Did it ever go west? Did garment manufacturing in this country ever go west of the of Kansas City in any great amount? Well, garment manufacturing was always ongoing even in Los Angeles when it was going on in New York. Los Angeles continued to grow and grow. Dallas became a large manufacturing market. But there were regional manufacturing markets everywhere. Minneapolis, Kansas City, St. Louis, Portland, Seattle. There were manufacturers of, of ladies. So, well, wherever there was a mass of people who wanted product. Uh, there was some manufacturing, companies. exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, we all did manufacture in the same way. Uh, in, in coat manufacturing, where I was, where I started out and stayed for a while, we worked under the, what was called the section system of, of manufacturing with manufacturing parts of the garment and, and little sub-assemblies and then a final assembly of a product as it moved through the factory in a, in a traditional mass production line. In the East, they did most of the manufacturing by giving a tailor all the pieces and he would sew up a single garment one at a time. We didn't operate that way in Kansas City. And it, were there, uh, I would think, efficiencies and economies from the from the uh, assembly line process? Absolutely, there were efficiencies and the skills were different. We could train a power machine operator, that was what we sewed, to become very competent in, for example, making pockets or joining seams on the back of a coat, making the linings, without knowing all the tailoring required to make a single garment by herself. Did uh, well, uh, piecework payroll was a big part of that process. Was that present in the industry everywhere? By that I mean in Chicago and in New York, was piecework payroll part of the pay process, part of the earnings process? I'm not sure I can speak for the other for the other markets for sure. Kansas City it certainly was. 
an incentive based on your production. And I think in most of the markets, by the time I got into it, it was that case, except where there were still individuals making the whole garment. What was your particular job, Harvey? You came back from the war, Jordan Dance Company took over the manufacturing side of it, the junior coats and... Uh, I, got involved. I didn't take over the manufacturing, I got involved with it. Mostly I was involved in sales and marketing. Did a lot of traveling on the road, calling on our customers in small towns, and new territories, and uh, but had to become familiar with the operation, except for the actual sewing. I never was very accomplished in that. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were aware of the operation, but didn't directly supervise uh, the cutting and sewing. And uh, how big did your, how big did your company get? What was the apex of your sales volume in the? It was under a million dollars. Under a million at a peak, yeah, and that was, uh, I'd say, in the mid '50s, just about that time. Mm -hmm. And at that time, a million dollars was what, ten million today or fifteen million today? I don't know how you could. It's hard to say. That, I know. But, yeah, it, I know. It's it would represent a lot more today than it did then. Sure. How many uh, How many people did you have in your uh, sewing room in your manufacturing? When, when our, our, our plant was located at 808 Broadway, and uh, and we're at 905 Broadway right now, but 801 so Broadway. We were right across the street. Right across the street. Okay. Sorry. Right. We're at 801 Broadway, yeah. and uh, we had three floors. We had about 40 power machine operators. Uh, I'd say four people working in the cutting department. We had a half a dozen people pressers three or four people in the finishing, examining department. And then of course we had a shipping and receiving department, order filling department. And then on the first floor we had uh, three, there were three women in the office and uh, my dad and myself and a sales manager mm. when I started. So Harvey, how many, uh, uh, you talked about how many people you had in the in the manufacturing process, in the whole process, uh, where did you get your workers? Here and there, everywhere? Pretty much, we advertised the paper. What we ultimately attracted were a lot of, most of the people who worked in the factory were women who sewed at, at the machines. Most of them were people who did not have language skills or didn't have the appearance to work in a white collar office downtown. Many first first generation Americans, lots of refugees of all kinds, uh, who were able to earn a pretty good living, better than they could in a white collar position, but didn't have the appearance to work in a downtown office building, for example, mm -hmm. or, or were they comfortable in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. And many of them, even though they were foreign born and first time in the United States, had had some sewing skills wherever they had come from, even though it may not have been on a power machine. Mm -hmm. Was there much uh, movement from one manufacturing company, from one garment company to another, on the part of an employee, or did it, was there longevity associated with it? There, there were a number of very loyal employees who pretty much stayed with you, but we were a seasonal business, so there were always layoffs. In the coat manufacturing business, we basically had two seasons, a spring season and a fall winter season. Uh, so in between seasons there were always considerable layoffs and sometimes employees would pick up jobs elsewhere in other plants or might fill in a dress manufacturing company that had five seasons through the year and didn't lay off as many as we did. And th But there was always kind of a back and forth movement of employees from mm -hmm. time to time. And they were all, I mean, working within a three or four or five block area so it wasn't like when you changed jobs, if you did, you had to catch a streetcar and go the other direction. Yes, mo most of the manufacturing was done in this area down here. There were some firms that were away from the area, but most of them were located in the garment district area. To the, to the best of your knowledge, it's hard to say because they were everywhere, depending on whether you did boys wear, children's wear, maternity wear. Uh, but at the apex of the manufacturing, business in Kansas City, how many people were probably producing a product with their name on it 
and had it out there with salesmen on the road. And how many different companies or how many people were employed? How many different companies and then how many people were employed? It's hard to say uh, the number of companies because you can become a manufacturer very easily and very quickly in a very small way if you wish with a couple of sewing machines. Uh, my guess at the peak, uh, perhaps 30 or 40 actual companies manufacturing. Um, I was trying to remember, we had two associations, two groups in the market here. We had a Garment Manufacturers Association, which was essentially an association of people who manufactured garments, and the association was organized to, to negotiate contracts with the union, because we were all, with one major exception, union shops here. There was another organization called the Kansas City Apparel Association, which my dad had been president of back in the mid-30s, which was an association of everybody connected with the apparel business in Kansas City, and it was organized to help develop and market the products that were sold in the Kansas City area. And uh, apparel, the Kansas City Apparel Association originally had been part of the Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. And when I was a kid, I remember my dad would be leave on these junkets where they'd wear white shirts and red ties, and they'd get on a bus and they go out to uh, Sabetha, Kansas, or Salina, or even uh, in smaller towns close in, and the wholesale plumbing supply guys would go to the plumbers in the town, and the guys in the apparel industry mm -hmm. would go to the, to the various retail stores. So, but the Apparel Association was, was the major organization, and I think it went I'm trying to remember, I think we probably had as many as 60 or 70 or maybe even 80 <laughs> members at the time, but that included people who were suppliers to the trade who were officed in Kansas City. They, were, they joined. Mm -hmm. Button manufacturers, uh, notions, yes, right. that kind of thing. And as you can see in our museum, we had our own slick paper fashion magazine, Fashion Topics, which was distributed only to retail stores, not to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Harvey, who were your customers? Our, our, our I mean, who are the customers? Who's got and how many salesmen did you have at, at Style Line? And then probably not too many, three or four probably. Huh? We had we had about it, it, often we had about seven or eight sales. Seven or eight with two major two lines. I mean a spring line and a winter line or right. whatever you call them. And so who were the customers? How far did you go and how small was the customer that you called on? When we were in the, and we were manufacturing uh, our own products. We had salesmen even in, in the Los Angeles area, and, and, one, and on one occasion briefly in the New England area, but mostly, as I said earlier, between the Alleghenies and the Rocky Mountains. We, uh, our principal customers were independently owned stores. That would be a ladies' apparel store, a family clothing store, a junior department store. Um, we sold some major department stores in the big cities, but our salesmen kind of tended to go to the smaller communities and the independent store owners where they could find someone who had the authority to sign an order. Also, Kansas City, we had, we were often accused by the manufacturing guys in New York as not being in the coke business, but we were in the finance business. We tried to get on the road earlier than the New York market book our lines, book our orders very much earlier with the stores, and then finance the shipments so to give them extra time to pay the bills. So as a result, we could sell earlier, because, and, and we did. What were the terms, typically, for it? You're going out and calling this small clothing store in Sabetha, Kansas, and he doesn't have the cash to pay you right now, he sells the merchandise. What were the terms that you sold him? Well, typical terms in the industry were were called 810 EOM. That was 8% if you paid by 10 days from the end of the month in which you received the merchandise. Then there was dating put on that so that no matter when it was shipped, for example, we would go on the road in January, with as early as January sometimes, with fall merchandise to be shipped into the stores starting after the 4th of July. With dating, to make it appear that the shipment was actually received in the store in September, and the bill would be due then in October. So we would book an order as early as January for which we would not be paid 
into the following October. And, uh, but that's, that enabled us to book our orders with the people. Now, big city department stores wouldn't book that far in advance. So we've tried to concentrate on the people where we could do it because we had to make our peace goods commitments far in advance, buying woolen mill, woolen textile products from New England principally. We had to make those commitments in November and December. For and you got the same uh, price terms, terms and conditions from them that you turned around and gave to your customers. Not true. Not true? <laughs> you had to pay right away? Well, not right away, but pretty close. We, did, we didn't have the long term. You didn't post-date it. Uh... Yeah. No. We, the New England mills mostly were factored through, uh, were, were sold on terms. They were factored, the accounts were factored, and the factors were pretty demanding of their of payments. We had a little bit of time, but not as much as we extended to our customers. Mm -hmm. How important was it in the, you were in the junior coat business principally, how important was uh, uh, fashion uh, for you in terms of being competitive and having the merchants say, I like that. I mean, you, it was probably pretty standard merchandise, wasn't it? I mean, there wasn't a lot of room for high fashion because the, the prices couldn't, wouldn't justify it. Well, but every season we had, there were a variety of different fabrics that we used every year, so it was necessary to go on the market, see what fabrics were fashionable, tweeds or coverts, broadcloths, uh, fleeces, all the different kinds of fabrics that would move in and out of fashion demand. And so we tried to be on top of that, so we'd go into the market early to look at those fabrics, find out what the direction would be for color that year as far as texture and finish. And, uh, and then we'd find what had been very popular selling as this previous season had ended in the higher price lines. And from there we would get direction. There were also houses in New York that were called, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, uh, I think they, they referred to them as style houses, but I'm not sure, where they would, you would go to those places, the designers would go to those places, and I would go with the designers to those places, and we would see styles bottled, and you could buy the pattern from those pattern houses, and make, of course, no, one, no designer worth his salt would say, I'm going to just copy that one. He'd have to make some adjustments and modifications to make it his own artistic creation, so yes. to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but it, was, it, was, it, was, it was changing all the time because you know, fabrics mm -hmm. would, uh, that weren't mm -hmm. in style were not worth very much. And so uh, you're buying fabrics in New York, so probably the big fabric shows and so on were really important for all the manufacturers here to attend. Absolutely. Right? Most all in woolens, particularly, uh, some of the some of the fabrics that were used by the sports or dress manufacturers, they had salesmen who traveled on the road. But most of the woolen mills showed through sales agents in New York City, and you had to go in there pretty much during a period of time when the mm -hmm. lines were opening mm -hmm. to place your orders. Did you uh, were you making money at Style Line? Making some money, but that's the reason we folded up at the end because we were not making money toward the end. Typically, in the garment manufacturing business, I mean, coats and suits and dresses, uh, was it a tough place to make a buck, or could a manufacturer become wealthy if he got big enough and successful enough? Yes, it was possible, and, and many did. Uh, here, it was, it was a little more difficult here, I, I believe, because we all owned our own manufacturing and production facilities here. So that gave that limited us in some ways. It gave us better control over our product and our quality, but it limited our ability to take advantage of a red hot style or a mm -hmm. fashion swing that we couldn't really. We'd be sold up and we couldn't make anymore. Uh, if you work with contractors to make products for you, as the New York market did, you just get another contract shop to make another 500 coats for you if you, if you had the sales for them. When did you stop your own manufacturing and begin using a contract manufacturer? When we closed out the coat manufacturing company in 1957, we shifted over into focusing on lady sportswear, which was becoming much more important than dresses had been. Sweaters, particularly sweaters, blouses, pants, and skirts was where we focused. And we would do business with knitters who would knit under our label or 
people who would manufacture skirts and pants and blouses for us under our label. So it gave us great flexibility. Also then slowly enabled us to move into the use of imported products, which we then began to use considerably. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about the, uh, you had the garment group that was focused only on the uh, garment workers union, and then of course you had the larger one that you described in which your dad had been president a number of times. What were the relations like with the Lady Garment Workers Union or his predecessor or successor? We never, uh, we never really had any trouble. And to my knowledge, there was never a strike in the, in the union. Uh, it, it certainly wasn't while I was working there. And as a kid, I don't remember hearing much about ever having a strike in the industry, although mm -hmm. possibly, but not during my period did they ever have a strike. Got along well with the union. We negotiated as an industry with them, not as individuals. Um, only problem I ever had with the union is uh, one of my first jobs. When you manufactured a product and you sewed in each, uh, and a power machine operator would just say, make a sleeve all day long, they never really got to see the finished product. So one of, one of my first jobs when I went to work is I said, you know, the people who are sewing on the fourth floor never see the product that's finished down on the third floor. So I was going to hold a style show during lunch hour one day and brought in some fashion models and we were going to show our fashion line so our, our employees could see what the line actually looked like, what they were making, take a little pride in the work. So I arranged all the tables in the, in the lunchroom in a big U and had the models parade down in the U. And I had somebody did the commentary, and, and I th everybody I thought had a good time and got to see what, take a little pride in what they were doing because they got to see what the product mm -hmm. finally right. got to work. Got a hot call from the union office that afternoon because in those days there was a good deal of segregation in employment in the industry. There were African Americans, not sewers, but employed principally in pressing. Departments, and sometimes in examining or, or finishing, but not in the sewing. And I had made the mistake uh, back up. During lunchtime, they sat at separate tables in the lunchroom. I had made the mistake of making a big U, which was like one table. Then that meant blacks and whites had to sit at the same table, and the union called me on that and said, no, no, don't you do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard for me to understand how that how they could take that position. Don't, don't let blacks be with the whites anymore. They were their own union members, but uh, so no more fashion shows with uh, U-shaped tables. No, it was a good idea, and it, and it worked very well, except the call from the union. Hmm. Yeah, but that we really never had any problem with the union, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. So in 1957, you ceased manufacturing and, and, and began contract. How, how long did Styline then or a successor company stay in business? No, Silent was liquidated and went out of business. Okay. For a while we had, we made a few coats, we had contracted to have a few coats made under the Stylon label and continued to try to sell them, but we gave that up after about two seasons of work. Mm -hmm. And then, so you morphed into the sportswear business. Sportswear business. How long did you stay in the sportswear business? We stayed in the sportswear business, well, we stayed in the sportswear business up until about 1990, but before then we started to move into the accessory business. People said, that's another area we should be in, fashion accessories, uh, costume jewelry, scarves, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the things, uh, caps, things like that that were accessory items. We moved into that area and then we sold that business to a employee of ours has been our, our sales manager who took over the accessory lines and continued in business. He's still in business today. And we got into the career apparel business. Um, bought a company that was making uniforms for employees and hotels and offices. And then we got into the school uniform business. And then we got a contract to manufacture uniforms for the VFW Ladies Auxiliary. And then got a contract to manufacture the caps for the VFW Ladies Auxiliary. And currently, that's the only thing the company does now is we're 
still have a small contract with the VFW to make their uniform caps. So the, while the company began in 1930 with your dad and his New York partner, Siegel, uh, you're still in business under your leadership uh, here in, in 2004. Very small business. Very small business, Very small but business. nonetheless, it's a continuum of a continuum of a name that's been very active in the in the Kansas City uh, garment uh, district scene for a long time. Hence, your interest in the garment manufacturing and the museum that you have it in which we're now uh, sitting. With with I add must add by the way with the important direction and leadership of Ann Brownfield, who really runs the museum for us. Well, that's wonderful. We'll have to, we'll have to interview Ann about her uh, notions about the uh, uh, garment industry. When did the garment industry start, the manufacturing of garments in Kansas City start going away? And number two, in your opinion, what was the cause? I've had people tell me that, that they thought there were two causes. One is the market went away, that the small clothing stores dried up by, with the advent of the box stores. And then I've had another person say, well, it was really the competition, competition from low-cost labor overseas. When did all that start? And in your opinion, what's the uh, uh, reason for it? Well, the, the principal reason, in my opinion, was that our market went away. But the reason for that is not the emergence of box stores. The reason for that is this market sold principally through the agricultural part of the United States. And in 1930, I remember seeing a figure once when Freed Siegel Company started, 27% of the people in the United States lived on farms in the United States. My guess is in the Midwest that was probably a higher figure maybe a third. By 1990, the number of people who were living on farms in the United States was less than 2%. So as you drive around the territory, Midwest now, which I did a lot of when I first started traveling, there were lots of towns that had two or three or four stores that carried apparel, men's, women's, children's apparel. Many of those towns now don't have a single store that carries apparel. When I was starting out in the industry, there was, or when I was, I guess, much younger, I spent one summer, part-time a summer, on a farm up near Polo, Missouri, 1937. Farming was very labor-intensive. There were lots of people. Now, they didn't make a lot of money, but there was some demand for products and services all the time in small towns. By 1950 or 49, when I got in the business, Farming had become much more specialized. Farms had gotten bigger, more mechanized. There were fewer people. As, as farming diminished in population, farming population diminished, the towns disappeared, the stores disappeared. That, in my opinion, is the main reason our market mm -hmm. went down. So your customers disappeared because their customers disappeared, namely the farmer, the man on the tractor, and the, uh, living out in America's heartland. Right, now, the, the, the advent of the box stores and imports didn't help any, but if the people had been there, it would have been a different story. The people just literally weren't there. But let me give you a funny, good illustration of that, as I recall. 1937, I spent that part of a summer on a farm up near Polo, and I remember every day at lunch, there were always, it was late in the summer, it was kind of harvest time for stuff, there were always a whole bunch of people sitting at lunch. I never knew who those guys were, I know they didn't live at the farm, but there were guys who would come over to help with the harvest. It was a small farm, poor farm, really tough. They had a hard time making it. But there were lots of people, and there was lots of food to eat. 1950, I went up to Red Oak, Iowa to see a customer of ours to show our coat line up there. And she said, uh, meet me over at the house and have dinner with us tonight, because there's no place in town to eat after 5 o'clock anyway. So as I drove up to her farmhouse, she had a farm outside of town, a big farm, I noticed the corn was growing from the county road up to the front porch. So I said to her husband, I said, what do you, what do you do on this farm? So we just grow corn and got to have a few dairy cattle. 
I said, what do you do if you need a tomato? He said, I go in town and buy it at the grocery store. Now, when I was a kid, every, that summer I spent on the farm, everything we ate grew on that farm. This farm at Red, outside of Red Oak had hardly any employees on it. I don't think they had one full-time person. He'd, he'd hired people to come in when he had to harvest the corn or plant the corn or whatever, I don't remember. But the people just weren't there. See, so the garment manufacturing industry did nothing more than many other industries did, which was to follow the change in dem demography of the United States and morph themselves into something where they there was a need for them. Now, had we, had we stayed in business, it would have been hard to service the box stores with domestic production in those days. That's why so much production has had to go overseas. And if a big company demands big quantities and very competitive prices. Do you prices, think that could have uh, been done? Well, it was done for a while by some of the work clothing guys. They were able to do that with jeans and things like that. But even that's now pretty much moved out. They were the last holdouts, as I recall in manufacturing throughout the Midwest. Mm -hmm. It's commonly thought that uh, most of the garment manufacturing industry in Kansas City, which was very large, as you said, in the in the 40s, right after the war, and up until the 50s. And it continued on into the 60s and 70s, but it was slowly going down. Going it's a common uh, perception that almost all these companies were uh, begun by Jewish entrepreneurs. Is that correct? Many of them were. Many of them were in Kansas City, and uh, mostly, I, I, I don't know exactly why this, in the first place, I guess one of the reasons was there was no restriction on their success. There were, I happened to go to, uh, went to graduate business school on the West Coast after I got out of the Navy, and uh, noticed that employers for a lot of the major companies were restrictive in their employment practices in those days. And if you were Jewish, you were, didn't have the opportunity to go to work for a lot of, in a lot of industries and for a lot of companies. Garment manufacturing did provide an opportunity where there was no restriction on you because of your Fair, religion. Very low uh, barrier to entry in terms of cost. Like you said earlier, uh, if you had a couple of sewing machines, if you had what it took, you could start a business. Right. And, if, and for those who particularly had not had the advantage of much education but had some sales ability and started out as salesmen, many of them became garment manufacturers by because they knew the customers and they, they could hire people to run factories for them. Mm -hmm. But the earlier notions in the, our fabric companies, the dry goods companies, uh, were, were most of them in Kansas City were not a Jewish businessmen. Not the earliest ones, no. Uh -huh. no. And the biggest ones were not. Uh -huh. So it was just an amalgam of, uh, of uh, various cultures and various opportunities for various people. And immediately after World War II, uh, here in Kansas City, there was, a, there was a fairly good influx of refugees, Jewish refugees from Europe. Uh, many of them found employment in the garment industry because their employers were Jewish, their language skills were somewhat limited, and it was easy for them to get to work here, so we had a number of Jewish employees. And I mean, we had a few in our factory, and the women with the tattoos on their forearms from concentration camps. Mm -hmm. They never talked about it with us at all, but we had some of them. Mm -hmm. Well, now, when did uh, the freed, your daddy, when, when did he uh, end his uh, involvement in the garment business? When he passed away, or did he quit and retire? And Never retired. He was active until the week before he died. He'd Which was down. when? When did he pass away? Uh, 19... Uh, 1984. Uh-huh. And your mother, she, she had died prior to that time. Prior to she that time. So, so he was in the, the uh, garment saddle until till the very end. We just right. didn't quit. Uh, yeah, he kept working until the end. And That's he, a and, wonderful story. And my mother was involved in the, in the Freed Siegel operation, too. After we grew up and got into grade school, she started working in the business in 19, the early 1930s. And she continued to work until she died. Mm -hmm. yeah. Probably why they lived a long time. Uh, did uh, Siegel ever get to Kansas City? Siegel used to come to Kansas City once or twice every year. And, uh, 
he and Dad would go over some stuff, but Dad used to go back to New York four or five times a year. His family was still there, and my mother's family in Connecticut was there, so we all used to go back and make trips in the summertime. That's great. What, were the big changes in the garment industry dictated by uh, the manufacturer, by the customer? The, who dictated the changes in the, in the garment industry? They came from a variety of places, but I thought the biggest impact uh, in the industry was dictated by the big, by the big retailers, the Sears Roebucks of the world, the J.C. Penney's. Uh, if the government, if Congress passed a law with regard to flammable fabrics that they must be labeled a certain way, many garment manufacturers always disregarded that, and the enforcement of all those regulations was pretty, pretty sparse. But if Sears Roebuck said, if you want to deliver child's pajamas to us, they better have a flammable tag on it according to the law or we won't place an order with you or we won't keep it or we'll return anything that doesn't come in that way. Well, that made manufacturers then adhere to the act. We found the same thing true in wool products labeling. Big chain stores demanded that the products be labeled appropriately. The same with country of origin tags. If it was left up to the industry, the industry was always very slow in responding, and the enforcement was always negative. You know, it was almost non-existent. Sure, and mm -hmm. and of course today it's tougher than it's than it's ever been. So, well, everything is more standardized, and, and 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 the people who buy the product, they don't want to have any problems at the retail end of it. They want the manufacturers to to adhere to the law regulations, the rules, so, so they don't get in any trouble. And that's the that same thing happened with uh, in the industry after I got out of the manufacturing. There were a lot of counterfeit products manufactured in the industry. In other words, take a uh, Lacosta alligator and stitch it on a, a cheap polo shirt made in China and sell it as a Lacosta shirt. Well, big retailers wouldn't buy that kind of stuff. So they, they, they really were the, the policemen for the industry, in my opinion. Well, thank you for your thoughts. I want to ask you a, one last question. Uh, you told us about your mom and your dad. Your mama came over from Russia, met your dad, then they married, and you were born in New York City and came out here. Uh, how about uh, your family? My, my children? Yeah, do you have a wife and children? A wife, three kids. All the kids are, none of them live in Kansas City. None of them ever wanted to be in the garment business. They're all doing their own thing and seem to be doing very well. Hey, what are your kids' names and where do they live? Son Jeff uh, is married, has one child, lives in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. He runs a hospital there. Son Mark is married, has three children. He lives in Kirkwood, Missouri. He's a lawyer for Jefferson County. And my daughter Paula is a clinical psychologist. She's married, has three kids, lives in Salina, Kansas, has a practice out well, there. Well, you have one not too far away, well, two, one in Salina and one in St. Louis. Right. And how many grandchildren? Seven grandchildren. Seven grandchildren. Any great grandchildren yet? No, no, not yet. I'm not old enough, Gary. No, you will be. <laughs> you will I hope be. so. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> a, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful family. So, still in the business in, in various phases, I mean, it's, opportunity comes up from 1930 to 2004. May it continue for many more years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Right, I remember personally being uh, around here in the early 50s and the garment industry is really bustling. You'd always smell Folgers coffee and there were things going, but uh, even prior to that, when you have a rec recollection of it as a young boy before the war, and then uh, after the war, what was uh, what was your take on how it was down here in the historic garment district of Kansas City? Well, it it was almost like a New York street scene on Mondays, particularly on Mondays, but al but almost every day in the garment district. Uh, Monday was the day that the out of town buyers came in to replenish their stocks, buy from the wholesalers and manufacturers to have merchandise shipped or taken back with them to their stores. 
And so you see that milling around on the street. You see trucks unloading rolls of fabric into the factories. You see the Railway Express guy taking boxes of coats out to be shipped to stores all around the country. You see salesmen loading samples into their cars, getting ready to take off to call in the territory. During lunchtime, you'd see the women wearing their cotton wash dress, their print cotton wash dresses who worked in the factories and it was hot and we didn't have air conditioning, so they wore just thin cotton dresses. And amidst all that, you'd see high fashion models, beautifully dressed with high heels, running up and down the streets, carrying their millinery bags, running to a fitting with one designer or to a photo shoot with a photographer for our fashion magazine. It was, it was just really a hustling, bustling neighborhood. And it was that way. Five, and there were times when the industry was open seven days a week. I remember there was a period of time in the late 30s when the wholesalers were all open on Sunday because some of the retail stores said that's the only time we could get away to come to town would be on Sundays. That unfortunately didn't last too long. Mm. What was the main hotel where most of the garment people stayed when they came in from out of town? That's interesting because Kansas City really was a, a cross section of a, uh, a tourist attraction in the sense that stores, people who are more affluent store bars would stay in hotels like the Muehlbach Hotel and would eat at, at the nice restaurants at the hotel or the nice restaurants in town to go to lunch at Wolfermann's. The customers from some of the smaller stores that didn't have quite the same uh, assets uh, would stay at hotels like the Rosbach Hotel, eat in the Forum Cafeteria for lunch, and their idea of entertainment was just to sort of walk up and down 12th Street and ooh and ah what was going on in the bars and grills there. Uh, so we had, we had them from the lower end of the economic scale to the upper end, and we had facilities for all of them. Mm -hmm. Where'd the uh, uh, garment, all these garment manufacturers right down in this part of town, they probably had lunch together. Where'd, they all, where'd you eat lunch? And uh, you know, yell and scream, and carry on about the state of the business and all that. Well, the, one of the main places was a Sydney's restaurant in the corner of 9th and Broadway. Later on, Weiss has opened a restaurant in the Coates House that was a big attraction. And, uh, but, and, and Tallman's Grill, I guess, down on A Street was a, was a place that people used to go. But mostly lunch was a run-in and run-out kind of place. We also had, we, uh, regular fashion uh, market times during the year um, where we'd have salesman shows originally at the hotels, then later at the municipal auditorium, then later out at the old this airport, um, and th those times manufacturers, their sales reps would set up and show to out-of-town buyers. At the same time, or at some time different weeks, wholesalers would have their own fashion shows. For each Siegel, we used to rent the top floor of the, of the President Hotel and bring in buyers for dinners, and we'd have our own fashion show, and we'd entertain buyers that week. And but we, we were just one. All the wholesalers did the same thing. So bars would come in from out of town and be wined and dined for four or five days, you know, four or five times a year. That was a, that was a big thing. How do you view the metamorphosis of the garment district right down here where we're sitting into whatever it's going to become? What is it becoming? Well, right now it's what has happened because the, the buildings were saved the building, these buildings were all built mostly in that 1898 to 1914, 15 era. But because they were occupied for so many years, they didn't deteriorate so much. And the streetscapes remain and the buildings remain, so they became a viable place for companies like DST to move into, take over rehab. And so now it's, there's a little bit of residential in the area. It started with the Soho lofts on on uh, 7th Street, but mostly it's it's commercial. It's not manufacturing, and it's not retailing. It's mostly commercial activity of all kinds. We have photographers, we have architects, we have uh, oh gosh, we uh, still have Folgers Coffee, of course, and because the I can smell it, 
environmental regulation, we don't smell quite as much as we used to, but it still smells good when you can get it. So the industry, the, the, the neighborhood has come back very powerfully. And we have a number of, of good restaurants in the area. We have places like the Savoy that have been here since 1903. Uh, they're still in business. But we are, have now many people working in the district many more people working than we had 15 or 20 years ago when it was pretty deserved. I, I forgot to ask you, how many people at the height of the uh, garment industry uh, were hustling and bustling, working in the factories and on the streets here in Kansas City? We understand that the, the figure was close to 5,000 that we employed, mm -hmm. and as an industry we understand we were the second biggest employer in the Kansas City area. Uh, the, people involved with the agriculture stockyards area, they were the biggest industry employer, but we were the second. Thank you for your insight. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. Here are some scenes from the factory of Style Line. Yes, that's, that's, this, was, this was our showroom. Picture. This is this this was Mr. Epstein. He was one of the partners in, when the Styline Coat Company sound was founded. That's him in the design room at 808 Broadway. This is the cutting room, and that's where the fabric was spread back and forth in plies. And you can see how high that's about an eight-inch thick fly. And then you can see the long, the big cutting knife. They spread a pattern over the fabric, and then the cutter would take the cutting knife and follow them. Was it common for everybody to wear a coat and tie? A white? Just, just for that picture. Just for the picture. They didn't wear ties. But that must have been a day they had somebody come in and take some pictures. So. What's this picture, Herb? This here is our showroom at Styline Manufacturing Company. And there's buyers. There's our, there was our Missouri, Kansas salesman working with some buyers looking at one of the fabric, one of the garments out of our line market. And that's our own Ann Brownfield in that picture. Curator of our museum right there. Designer and Ann was also a manufacturer too. And retailer. Yeah, yeah. In every, every possible way. I had to go into retailing because I lost my job. <laughs> Gary, that picture over there. These are some of the labels on Coats and suits, dresses and so on, made in, in Kansas City. Oh, and, and Gary, when you talk to Sherman, uh, his, his uh, picture there of Big G, 